Hello, everyone, and welcome to Office Hours with John, Dave, and special guest, Rick Brimacombe. Hey, Rick. Hey, how are you doing? Fantastic. John, good to see you. Thank you. I'm glad to be back after a, a short hiatus. I hiatus. <laughs> That's the past version of hiatus, but I'm using it. I, hiatus. I don't even know. It's like hippopotamus. It's, hip, it's hiatai, I think. Hiatai. And, and John, yeah. where did you do that? Uh, I was here. I just had a lot of family stuff going on. So that kept me away last week. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we're all set and we're ready to start. And so I want to just uh, tease a little bit from John's intro that he sent out to the Voyager U community and uh, just introduce Rick and, and let you go in for folks that are joining as attendees. Make sure that you're asking questions as we go through. And then remember that after about 15, 20 minutes, we're going to open it up to uh, open conversation. So um, as a fractional professional, you're either closer to growth than you may ever been. And as a member of the leadership team with your clients, you get a front row seat. Not only that, you're probably handed an oar to help folks row towards the future. Sometimes you even have to take the wheel. As advisors and team players, our job as fractionals is to help bring businesses we serve to the next stage. And Rick Brimacombe is our guest star for today. And so Rick, share with us what you want everyone to know in the fractional community about ops, finance, IT tech, and everything that you want this audience to know about what they should do when they're looking to scale and grow. Well, Dave, uh, big question. <laughs> uh, big, big question. And the first of all, I'm not sure that I qualify to be a star. I'm not exactly sure what the criteria is, but that feels kind of like a high bar. You got to be uh, a good dude. That's all. Uh, I think well, yeah, I, got, I got that. I got that covered. Perfect. And I'm just Rick from Southwest Minneapolis. Although uh, my kids were uh, De La Salle Islanders. So John and I have a little bit of a rivalry deal going where we got the uh, Holy Angels community against the De La Salle crowd. So who am I? Rick Brimacombe from Southwest Minneapolis. Does that qualify me to be a star? It puts you right playing. where you need to be. All right. Yeah. But I'm where I'm supposed to be today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think first and foremost, uh, and I better say it this way, or John's going to hit me upside the head. I am a growth architect. And like you, Dave, and like you, John, um, I do that in essence on a fractional basis, although I carve it up a little bit different than that, but that's kind of uh, what I do. I work with uh, companies kind of in three different ways. Number one, through the Club E community. And so like Voyager U, uh, we're building uh, a community to support people trying to grow uh, their businesses with a focus on kind of lower middle market down to emerging growth companies. And certainly there are startups too, but I would say emerging growth to lower middle market is a sweet spot. And then through Brimacombe and Associates, I advise companies and go on their boards. And then Brimacombe Capital is my equity vehicle where I make investments and have equity participation, whether that be um, as a, a straight up investor or a co-founder, or maybe I'm earning sweat equity or, or what have you. Um, as far as the growth story, um, you know, that's a, a real deep one. And, and maybe there's a couple of specific things, either you or John would we'll get like to, to it. dive into those. But totally. We're all, things growth, into it. all things growth uh, can be thrown at the growth architect. So mm -hmm. I am here to architect your growth and to make your presentation today a fabulous one. That's, that's, that's all anybody can ask for. Um, yeah, I can't wait. You know, Rick and I have been working on growth uh, together conceptually with customers, with brands, with Club E for a couple of years now. And it's just, um, it's, uh, it's a fascinating thing that, that quite honestly, people, I think people should think about more and sooner. And uh, because when you think about growth more and sooner, you're going to get to those end stages a lot better. So Rick, we're just going to hammer you with so many questions today about well, growth. I'm, I'm here. Yep. Yep. And then, uh, but before we do that, um, uh, a couple people, I think I shared the actual panelist link. So if, uh, if you got in on the panelist link in the chat bar, I put uh, a regular link to register and get in here. So it was totally fine. You know what? You can come in as a panelist. You can come in as a guest. You can come in Equal as a giraffe. 
I don't care how you identify on this thing. It's uh, you are you and, and, and you be you. So just know but, that if, if there's F bombs though, I had nothing to do with it. So yeah, that's right. Rick is, Rick is, is he's, he's a pretty clean cut kind of guy. So exactly. Well, so growth, you know, this, this thing could go on for days, but let's anchor ourselves. You know, growth is, as I talk about it a lot, it's the province of small business in so many ways. We tend to think about growth through maybe Fortune 2000 and up because, because we see that, right? That's in the news. That's what's on CNBC. That's what's on, on all that. But where the real growth happens, I shouldn't say that's not real growth. But when you think about, Rick and I have talked about this here, so when you think about a business that might be doing $20 million, just, you know, that's a good sized business, right? You know, five or 10% to them, that is hard to do. And what ends up happening is businesses, as they grow, like these are monumental efforts. So we hear about, oh my gosh, you know, some giant company just acquired another giant company and that's growth. For sure. Don't argue with that. The Herculean effort to take, to take a $20 million company into a 5, 10, 20x exit or sale or acquisition is equally, if not harder. And so I was hoping we could talk about that today because I think that's more practical to all of us. You know, there's only there's 50 percent of the country and 95 percent of our workforce work for businesses under 200 million in revenue. So when you think about that, there's a lot of growth there. So um, first of all, I'll start with uh, John, uh, your partner uh, in Voyager U and part of the Voyager U community, Jason Voyevich. Uh, Jason actually helped me do the original branding for Brimacolm and Associates back in 2005 when I launched the firm. And the tagline that he uh, helped me anchor on was grow or die. <laughs> and I was talking about what kind of um, situations I'm interested in and what kind of things um, I thought I could add value to. And I was just kind of talking. And I said, well, lots of times these companies have to grow or die. And I kept rambling like I do and waving my hands all over everywhere. And Jason said, wait, 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 back up, hit the rewind button, go back there, talk about grow or die. And so that's my tagline. And yeah. I can meet people now that I haven't seen for 10, 15, 20 years and uh, they'll say, oh, yeah, I remember you're the, the growth guy or, or grow or guy, die. In fact, actually, interesting story. I had a little uh, respite last week and I went to St. Petersburg Beach. We drove down a couple of keys. I'm on Longboat Key at this restaurant. And this guy came up to me. I'm not kidding. He came up to me, taps me on the shoulder. He goes, are you from Minneapolis? I go, yeah. He goes, are you the growth guy? Yeah, I've seen you in the magazines and this and that. And so, um, yes, yeah, so grow or die. I think there's probably different phases. If you aren't growing on the front end, literally you probably die because there's not enough business to be had. Then later in life, you need to grow because you need to uh, add more people. And there's a, a component of um, just kind of cobbling things together. And then from there, maybe you want to attract uh, other partners um, or other investors or something like that. And then from there, a lot of companies might get stuck in doing things. Hey, we've always done it this way and we don't want to change. Um, they get locked into a certain way of thinking. And so, yes, you can always make continual improvements, but uh, true growth might happen when you think outside the box or you launch a, a new product or you do some kind of internal skunk works efforts to, to change things up. And so growth has a lot of different layers and they happen um, over time and at different stages, Folks have different needs, and I guess that's uh, probably my sweet spot is to meet people where they're at because a company, like you said, doing 20 million has certain needs and, and, certain, uh, and has certain constraints. And then other folks, that are, whether they're a startup or an emerging growth company or they're doing five or 10 million, everybody is on a journey with certain constraints and assets, and I try to meet them where they are and come up with a game plan for moving them forward from there. That's that, that that's awesome. So let me let me anchor you to one thing you said, and that's the beginning of growth. I think you were talking about that. Like, so let's take a a small business that might be a few years old. What's the first thing that they should be thinking of beyond the day to day? I got to make this company successful. Sure. Um, what is the first thing when they're thinking growth? When you want to think about the growth, what's the first thing? There's first bug you would put in their ear, Rick. I think um, most people fall in the trap of taking whatever business comes their way because they're worried about putting food on the table and they're trying not to <laughs> die, right? They need to pay the mortgage. They got a couple of employees mm -hmm. and some, some business comes at them and they take that. 
I would say trying to focus their efforts on a, on a niche, doesn't necessarily have to be a micro niche, but a niche so that they can concentrate their efforts uh, and their time. And then also come up with the right solution to match the needs of that certain persona or customer set. And so that you can hopefully build some scale if you zero in close enough, have a strong enough value proposition and you're targeting a narrow enough audience that you can scale. So I think people get into trouble. They try to do too much. They take on anything that comes their way. It dilutes their efforts. And I think the, the narrowing of the focus um, is probably the first thing that somebody should try to do. Narrow focus. And, and that is true when you're trying to grow and you've just started, you look at it and you start, you kind of think of survival, right? Like, yep, I want to pay the bills. I want to pay my staff. I want to grow. I think a lot of people think about growth is on the build up side. I want to add some staff. I want to add some capability. I like to think about growth on the other side, on the market side. What opportunity is, we'll bring those things along, but if you build it, they will come. It has really caused a lot of people a lot of pain. Um, planning for an outcome, like just, a, just the process of doing it. Um, how do you take them through that, Rick? How do you, do you kind of, do you kind of um, assess a little bit or how do you, how do you start sure. the process? Sure. Well, I think the build it, they will come uh, analogy is a great one. And most people fall trap to that. Okay. And they think, hey, I'm going to come up with the best widget ever, or this is a new mouse trap or, or what have you. I think the, the problem there is a not enough uh, interaction with the potential customers on the front end. So they build something and now they're locked into that thing. So they're not iterating based on what they hear on uh, the marketplace. And then they might say to themselves, oh, if I do a little bit of a pivot, that's a bad thing. I'd actually go the other way. If you're not pivoting, you're not listening to the market. And then the last thing is because, as I said earlier, they're not um, anchored in on a specific vertical. They're trying to do too many things. And so uh, really kind of figuring out how do I reach that specific customer? So go to market for that particular customer and that particular need at that particular price point. And sometimes you're priced at, at a higher level than a lower level, which means uh, your go-to-market strategy is a little different. And if you lock in on a certain persona, you might have to move a little bit to pick a different persona. And so narrowing the focus allows you then to pick the right path. And those things uh, hopefully all kind of come into alignment and will allow folks to get off the ground and start to get a little bit of scale and most importantly, to be responsive to people finding you because you get known for a certain thing versus you always having to go out and knock on doors and you know, really kind of work and scrap and claw and fight to, to get that, uh, that, that lead and, and then ultimately that sale. Yeah, yeah. The, um, and we should talk about how hard that is. You know, it's, uh, I have started businesses from scratch. I know, Dave, you have too, but it is incredibly difficult to get a, a leadership team or an owner to go, you're doing it. You got your 80 hours a week that you're doing, and now I need you to do more. And that more you need to do is really hard, scary stuff. Yeah. There, yeah. Are there, are there tools that you recommend or, you know, what are the things that kind of get some like sure. embracing that? Cause that's hard, right? When you're 80 hours a weekend or 60 hours a week. And like, now I got to think about this other dimension. Um, sure. What do you run into there, Rick? So the first thing is I tell people um, when they tell me about their plan and they're either a startup or, or uh, merging growth or kind of early stage thing, is I tell them they're trying to do something very difficult. And so I think the first thing it would be to anchor your mindset on what you're trying to do, knowing that it's going to be hard. I mean, if you don't train for a marathon and you start off on a 26 mile track and that first half mile, your legs are starting to kill you. Yeah, well, you didn't. You didn't train A and B, your mindset isn't right that you have to go 26 miles on this thing. So getting the mindset right, I think is first. So I try to anchor them there. And then uh, something to the effect of letting them know that it's very difficult to create something from nothing. It's, that's why it's much easier for me to have a company reach out to me with 200,000 in sales or half a million in sales or a million in sales, because now you got some building blocks, you got some Legos you can work with. If you start literally from scratch and have to build up from there, that is hard. So getting the mindset right and then doing some things, which we'll talk about here in a moment, uh, to kind of push the ball forward, 
again, with, with the knowledge that building something from nothing is very difficult. The next thing is I try to let people know that um, being early and being wrong look exactly the same. <laughs> let me say that again. Being early and being wrong look exactly the same. So let's get the hell out of being early as fast as we can and at least scratch from the list that we're wrong, which means early traction. So how do we get early traction, early customers? Is it that we pre-sell what we're doing? Is it that like year end 2021, we offer some incentives to get people to buy uh, before we get to the start of 2022? But things that you can get folks moving so that you can say to yourself, all right, I have something and this is worth pursuing, or hey, I'm gonna pull the ripcord and, and bail on this because I'm just not getting anything. So what are the early wins? And the early wins don't necessarily have to be revenue. It could be people signing uh, up for the product once you get it. It could be people being willing to uh, be a beta customer for you. It could be people willing to participate um, in some survey work and, and talk to you about your idea. There's a lot of little wins that can come before you get a, a revenue um, event. And so little wins allows you to uh, scratch from the list that this thing is just a no-go and that's gonna help from a mindset to make this happen. So now your mindset is, this is a 26 mile marathon. I've scratched from the list, this is a fail. And then now kind of what are the first couple of things I'm going to do? And I'm going to try to find the customers that communicate to me the most significant pain point that are most likely or capable of buying. So a lot of people come up with a great uh, offering, good idea, but it's they're targeting a customer set who the selling cycles are extremely long and they have limited budgets. Okay, I'd rather maybe not shoot for the moon and come up with somebody who's got a wallet to pay for the offering and has a short uh, selling cycle because they don't need 1800 different approvals and run it up to the board and such. And so again, that feeds back to these little wins and kind of building on that uh, and being tight with the customer persona. So you're not trying to do everything for everybody. Which can be those, those distractions can really, really kill you. What you're talking about, Rick, I think in a lot of ways can be, it's almost um, fits in that area of give yourself forgiveness to fail early wins. For example, you, you might take 10 swings. And as we all know, three hits, gets you in the hall of fame in baseball, Absolutely. three out of 10. So, um, you know, that permission to fail or that ability or even the mental space, um, how big of an issue is that for people who struggle with that? I, I think it's a real big one. And I touched on it earlier. People's uh, lack of willingness to pivot means to me, they aren't listening. And they're too anchored in on that original idea, which we all know is never right spot on. So I think they need to listen to the customer set and they need to be talking to customers. Again, build it, they will come suggest they aren't even talking to customers. So if you're going out to customers and you're talking to them and then you're pivoting and you're listening, to me that says that somebody's um, on the right track. That also tells me that they're willing to kind of expand their way of thinking, listen to other people, they're not stuck in their ways, et cetera. And so those would be a couple of things to get them kind of on that, that right path uh, going forward. And then again, um, assess probabilities. Somebody who's got a very long life cycle, you know, it's the, it's the elephant, we're going elephant hunting. Yeah, but if the life cycle or the selling cycle is, is very long and the budget is gonna be tight and they're gonna have to get board approval and this and that, we might spend our whole first year chasing down and trying to, to bring down that elephant. Meanwhile, we're starving and we get to the end of the year, they say, no, we got nothing else going on. So um, I'd assign probabilities and timelines to everything and to try to um, make some educated assessments or guesses as to what are the right things. And um, I know that uh, you know, your business uh, in Voyager, you originally started with, with mostly marketing folks, now expanded to all kinds mm -hmm. of fractional uh, professionals, but uh, marketing consultant that I tap into, uh, Joe Polish, and he talks about ELF, easy, lucrative, and fun ELF. So is the money and the business that you're trying to track down ELF, or is it the flip side of that half, which is hard, annoying, 
lame and frustrating. And so uh, if you're not saying no to some people, it means you're not focused enough. And um, uh, my father, who unfortunately isn't with us anymore, uh, had a great uh, dental practice. And I know, John, your dad had a wonderful uh, business career and practice as well. One of my dad's things that he told me, which I've never forgotten, is he always wanted to fire a couple of people a year who were not good customers, uh, didn't else. show up on time, didn't pay their bill on time or whatever. And he always thought that if he wasn't firing a few people, that he wasn't focused in the right area. So again, all these things help create uh, yeah. a focus and, and a direction and a, and a compass that point people in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. And Rick, we've got a couple of questions that have come in over yeah. our chat so far. So uh, something Tom just asked, how would you prevent growing too fast, such sure. as Indian Motorcycle did in the early 2000s? Or like, I'm also thinking Krispy Kreme when it came in. Just sure. Spiked and uh, cratered. Sure. Well, um, let's see if I can get this right. There's an old saying that uh, ref it, uh, revenue is for vanity, profit is for sanity, but cash is king. And so those folks, they didn't have control of their cash needs. And usually that fast growth runs into trouble when you have to build out something or you have to put a bunch of money into building things and then get paid. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the opposite, where people pay ahead and they buy a one-year subscription like in a SaaS model, and you get all that cash on the, on the front end. Also, uh, we'll never forget one of the senior bankers at Piper Jaffrey when I worked there a million moons ago, and he said kind of the same thing, um, that uh, cash is, is not only king, but more important than your own mom. So uh, those businesses that fail because they grow too fast, did not have a handle on their cash and they didn't really fully understand their business model. And truthfully, they probably weren't getting enough good fractional CFO help to do their mm -hmm. financial modeling yeah. because they dropped the ball on the financing side. So mm -hmm. I'd love to have the problem of too many customers and too much demand, and then try to figure out how to serve that as opposed to the opposite of not having that. So frankly, there's, uh, and I don't know those individual cases don't ride a motorcycle but i do know christy christy creams are good that just was growing too fast not having controls and not understanding the cash needs of this system that they were building excellent yeah. well, and molly actually brought up pelotons having that problem right now yeah. it's, too they're having a heck of a time because yeah. they had this huge spike and now i think it's starting to peter and they finally got their operations in line but now they, you know, they're what they're trying to go. They're skating to where the puck is to keep a Minnesota metaphor, right? Yeah, yeah. And it turned out that they just don't have the cash anymore, right? Yeah. You know who else is having problems right now? I heard this the other day from my son, who's in the, who likes to study the markets, is um, Netflix. They think they've yeah. capped out. They can't bring any. There's like but the, their churn rate and their new customer acquisition rate are just they're almost equal. So mm -hmm. now, of course. I look at that and say, well, find another revenue stream, find some other way to make people happy. But mm -hmm. um, uh, it's interesting. You, you think these people are sort of, they have a moat, right? And maybe Netflix does because they, you know, their GDP is bigger than probably Spain, but still um, there kind of is no such thing as a moat, is there? Right. Well, I, I uh, yes and no, but, but I think more important than that issue would be they're thinking that good times are going to go on forever. Mm -hmm. And not everybody's going to buy a Peloton. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. You're never going to get 100% market penetration. So probably one of the mistakes they went there is like, we can keep selling these things where they should have asked themselves, all right, where are we going to max out on our market penetration? And right. what are we going to sell to these people after the fact to keep this business? And so they're you know, I'm not, I don't want to minimize uh, uh, what they've done and don't want to come down too hard on them, but they should have been asking themselves, hey, when this slows because we've sold as many of we're going to sell, what's kind of the next dance? And I would say that's probably what Netflix would be. The market penetration that they probably have is pretty darn high. And then um, I, I don't know all the details and certainly don't want to rat out anybody that that <laughs> I know of. But Netflix also, I think, runs in the problem of uh, multiple people using a certain login. Right. <laughs> and so they probably with a little extra security 
could probably extend their business model some, but maybe wow. part of why it's been successful is it is the lack security. But nonetheless, I think these are business model questions that people probably should have been able to see. John, one of the things we've talked about is seeing around corners. Yeah. Uh, they weren't looking around their corner and thought the good times are going to keep rolling. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of the moat, you know, if, you, if you're doing something completely unique, and it's patented and it's life-saving and stuff like that. Yeah, you probably have a pretty good moat, but in the world we're in, think of all the great companies that have been started that have just destroyed um, the folks that are entrenched that were perceived. Oh my God, Yeah, Yeah. totally, totally. If you look at what TikTok is doing to Facebook and Instagram right now, I mean, it is, talk about a moat, right? Yeah, we could could do a separate separate show on that. And then just a, a tool for people out there Clayton Christensen, who passed, I don't know, maybe about a year ago, great um, author, uh, great intellectual business person, uh, wrote uh, The Innovator's Dilemma, yeah. talking about yeah. why the entrenched incumbent can't adapt fast enough uh, to accept uh, and, and evolve with changing uh, times. And so, it, you know, part of it's lack of moat, but there's probably a bunch of other business issues wrapped in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to open it up to conversation for the entire panelist group or between the entire attendees. So fair warning to all of our attendees, I'm going to turn you into the ability to talk. So watch your mutes if you don't want to um, connect. And uh, I'm going to turn this on now. So go ahead and ask questions as we go through. I'm adding all of our folks on as talkers oh boy we got a lot of so we've we've got a good panel here and as as folks get ready with with their real questions i have one for you as well rick um for a business that is semi-established and and sort of sort of uh you know on a good growth scale um i might be referring to myself maybe um Good, good revenue. Um, <coughs> Busy web. <coughs> uh, uh, might, might be on, on screen right there. Um, but, you know, good growth, 40% or so year over year. Um, my, my struggle is how do I make sure that I continue to scale up without getting too heavy, right? So I like to, I like to have contractors. And I think part of the differentiating value is having real human beings that aren't um, overseas or anything, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's just higher quality that my clients expect, sure. but it's expensive, especially right now to hire. So sure. do you have some rules of thumb for when you should consider adding like people? Is it per hundred thousand is, is every, every, or, you know, I, I wish it were that clean and simple. I think it's a little bit case by case. Hmm. Um, let's just talk about your business a little bit. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions I would ask would be, how do companies like yours get valued in the marketplace when it comes time to sell? Right. So you want to try to keep that in mind. Uh, you used the word earlier about having a compass. So this would be another compass. And generally speaking, not all the time, but generally speaking, folks in your business might apply a multiple of say one-time sales. Mm-hmm. So your company's worth as much as you're generating in terms of sales. That's just Sure, one way to sure. look at it. So you are going to be rewarded for growth um, uh, and top line. However, people are also going to want your business to be profitable. And so if you're growing without any profits or worse yet, a loss, um, that's not as good for your business. Whereas other businesses like SaaS models, people are willing to accept Mm-hmm. the losses on the front end because that's a subscription model and they know if you play the long tail, you grow it and you get valued in the future because of this long tail you have. So that would be a way to look at your business is can you get subscriptions right. and not just be project work and mm-hmm. can the work that you do be profitable? So I guess the lens would be, hey, if you hire somebody or five people to bump revenue by a certain amount, Mm -hmm. how might you value that revenue from a market share um, perspective um, and our market value perspective? And then can you deliver on whatever it is you're going to deliver profitably? And a lot of companies get that second part wrong and they think, oh, the revenue's there, but they don't even know their costs. And 
because you have different things you do for companies. So you do thing A, you might make a lot of money. If you do thing B, you might lose money. And if you don't know that blended together, you say to yourself, oh, I'm making a 10% profit. I'm good. But the reality is A might have had a 20% profit and B might have lost 10%. So they, they net it out at 10 and you're, you're diluting yourself um, if you don't understand your cost structure as to where you're really making money. And in your business, yes, you want your revenue to grow, but you need to be profitable. Excellent. Well, and I think that really applies to fractionals as well, because as a fractional gets started, they've got one person, they're providing their own revenue, their own their own uh, company, but then they might start bringing on partners. And so for that, is it repeatable? Can you, you know, do what you need to do? One of the things that I was always cautioned on is make sure that I'm replaceable inside of my business because otherwise there's nothing to sell, right? right. So, you know, for fractionals, I think that's a unique challenge because you are your business by and large. So how do you set that up to scale so that you can do more? I have to speak to that. Mm, yes. Because I have to, I'm the guy. Yes. Um, the, the, and I actually learned this from Rick is um, I call it, you know, three clients in a side hustle. You might become a fractional at four or five clients and do very, very well. That's a very lucrative way to live. And, and, uh, and you can skate into retirement on that, but, but, you can also, because in the fractional world, you can also be a part of deals that you weren't part of before. For example, in my youth, back when I had less gray hair, I worked for Best Buy. I was on the corporate advertising team. And there was no way that through all of my effort and hard work, I was going to get a seat at the board table or some of those stock options. Not available to millions of people, right? Nothing wrong. That's their model. In this world, in the fractional world, that reality doesn't exist. You can get pieces and equity of things that you create, of clients that you serve. Um, just a new opportunity set opens up and it becomes in many ways your 401k. And so sometimes it's how you scale the business and other times is, hey, do I add value to a business to the degree where I can have a chunk, where it makes sense for me to have a chunk, where they need me on the board for a chunk because they're not going to get to those growth places Rick is talking about without it. So that, I think that's the new paradigm we're in. And certainly a lot of fractionals are feeling that. Yeah. And then I would also add to the extent that you could get monthly retainers versus project work that makes life a little better. Mm -hmm. um, and to try to focus on projects. Again, this is the, the, the focus that I talked about earlier. Focus on projects that you can be of value over the long haul as opposed to just do something, oh, hey, I'm gonna stamp this out in a month and then I'm done with that. So yes, there's a subscription yeah. component, but there's also what can I do with this client over the long haul? Can I continue to add value that they're gonna want me around, not just to take up space, but because I'm, I'm literally creating shareholder value for them, which also goes back to, to what I said to you, Dave, is if you understand what the economic model of creating shareholder value for your client is, you then can steer them towards the things that will benefit them from yeah. a business model standpoint. And then you're not just delivering your service, but you're actually increasing their payday at the end of, at the, end of the day. And as John mentioned, you might even get a piece of the pie yourself. So ultimately it might be your payday. Write that into your, for if you're fractional, write that into your business plan. If not for this year, write it for next year. You should be thinking, clients need you for that, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. They're like, I can't get there. I can't get there with daughter rick i can't get out there with a, a fractional whatever and and uh you will find a lot of acceptance to that and i think that goes to another question i was going to ask you rick and that is the market opportunity you know how many deals happen at the fortune five level it's a lot of numbers right but as, as far as deal volume it's not as much as it can happen just by virtue there's 30 million small businesses you know there's just just the, the math is more deals another thing i learned from rick rick you have all these little we should have a book called rick's quips you know, all these little, little tiny, little snack size things that come out and, and we got to write them down. But um, I think uh, at one point you said, write your number on a piece of paper and stick yes. it in the drawer. Right. So, so that was from uh, the book Built to Sell. Okay. And Dave, uh, we'll, we'll use your analogy. Like someday when you sell your business, what would you like to get for it? Um, and that's based a little bit in the realities of how big you're going to be and where you're at today, et cetera. But the other is, 
all right, I'm working as, as John said, mm -hmm. uh, to try to maybe supplement my retirement or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to achieve X. All right. How do you get to X is one part of the component. And, uh, and then the next thing is by writing down X, you're working towards a specific goal. And then exactly what John said is you write the number down and you put it in your, your desk. And as the book built to, to sell spoke uh, uh, to is then you don't lose track of what you're trying to accomplish. And more importantly, you don't maybe get greedy when the deal starts coming together you, and you can keep track on what you think a success looks like. And when the deal's coming together and the other side's irritating you, it's a way to keep you, you know, semi-calm and not get too worked up about the, the ins and outs of what's happening, as well as not to say, oh, they offered me X, but I, I'm going to try to negotiate it to X when reality was X was all you wanted uh, on the front end of this. So yes, John, good little tidbit for people to take is write down the number that they'd like to achieve in selling their business and put it in their desk. And yeah. then that way it uh, keeps them on track later on. And, and know that math is on your side on that, you know, for every deal, right? Let's say, let's say Netflix decides we're going to buy Spotify because we've got to have music in our portfolio. Fine. One, one massive deal, right? For every deal like that, there's got to be thousands of deals yeah. that answer to that number in a desk below that line, below that 200 yeah. million line yeah. where people are like, I'm happy with 5 million, 2 million, 1 million, 20 million. Um, just yeah. to, that's why this is such an interesting space is there's just so many more deals, yeah. so much more opportunity. And it's that exactly what you said. It's the pyramid. Very few companies up there in the you know trillion and billion space. That's why uh, they call those folks uh, unicorns, much mm -hmm. more you know, middle market, lower middle market, emerging mm -hmm. growth. Uh, but for these uh, uh, businesses where you're getting uh, measured, uh, whether it's revenue or, or multiples of, of EBITDA, uh, that you can create, build, grow, and sell for one to five to 10 to 20 million, just as you said, John. I mean, that's a nice payday. So uh, it doesn't have to be uh, a billion dollar exit to be a victory. And as long as you know your number, what you're working for, you can get 100% satisfaction with uh, building and selling uh, your business. Totally, totally. Dave? We've, uh, we've given a couple of books. I, I heard Built to Sell. I heard Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, one that I, that I just love and that I try to recommend a lot is E-Myth, the E-Myth Revisited. Um, are there any other must grab books as you're, as you're talking to businesses looking to grow and scale? Very good question. And this might be something that I'll want to think about and post somewhere after the fact. Mm -hmm. Those are two uh, books that, that I give out on a, on a regular basis, uh, or at least mention. A um, long time ago, uh, what actually feeds into um, Built to Sell is the Monk, M-O-N-K, and the Riddle. And the, the takeaway there is there's a mentor advisor that coaches this gentleman to um, focus on his business and narrow the niche that he's after. And it's a, it's a cute story, as well as they use dog analogies. And John, I know you like dogs. Love them. It's a dog analogy uh, to represent three different phases of a corporate lifestyle or a corporate uh, history uh, life cycle such that you need a couple of different um, dogs to um, lead you. And they talk about kind of CEO styles. First one, um, having uh, a, a pointer to point you in a direction. Second one is, is a husky, that sled dog to have you run fast as heck. And then uh, there's also going to be um, a, uh, oh, what's the dog that would pull you out of the snow in the Alps. Um, when that was the St. Bernard and Saint they had Bernard. a thing of booze on their neck. Exactly. Well, there'd be some trouble along the way and you need somebody to get you out of the trouble. And so they use a couple of different dog analogies. So Monk and the Riddles, a good book. Uh, one that's more recent trillion dollar coach. And um, I'm drawing a blank on the gentleman's name, um, but he coached several very big name uh, Silicon Valley tech companies. And it's kind of, John, to your point, some of his tricks and observations. Unfortunately, a gentleman's uh, no longer with us, but trillion dollar coach 
uh, was a very good read. And then uh, maybe the last thing I would say for folks out there is you never know when you're going to be able to connect dots and or as John and I talk about, look around the corner. Um, and so I'm a firm believer in the kind of good athlete theory. And so if you're just reading, just reading the newspaper or reading business plans or uh, kind of grabbing nuggets here or there, oftentimes that leads you or allows you to connect a couple of dots. And for instance, uh, one of uh, my advisory clients, uh, Bella Bridesmaid, sells bridesmaids dresses. Um, I saw some, some technology that were being sold to folks having weddings just through kind of regular reading things um, that I saw. I was able to reach out to them and say, hey, we got a channel that might be of interest to you. And then now I've been able to connect some dots that way. So you're always going to learn something by reading and they might be able to uh, help you do some things different with your own business, which is also a little plug uh, for not only the Voyager U community, but the Club E community. Yeah. A lot of education, a lot of networking, a lot of meeting people that will allow you to connect uh, some dots together in the future. Awesome. When they say your network is your net worth. I think that's something that's sitting yeah. thrown around a lot now. Yeah. Um, Rick, uh, what is it? There's a number, I think like 85. Anyway, there's a number of people that are very box checkers. You know, they love a process. Yeah. And, and um, I, I, I appreciate a process as well. Is there a process that people can start with or get their arms around when it comes to growth? Uh, and if so, what, what, what does it look like? Good uh, question. A um, couple things. Uh, there's uh, EOS, which I know, uh, John, you're very familiar with, and, and Dave. For a shop. Um, so EOS is, a, is a, a management system that's valuable. Uh, there's another process called three hag, um, highly, highly achievable goal playing off of the other hag, the hairy audacious uh, nice. goal anyway. Um, but the three hag way is another process. Um, so there certainly are some tools. With that said, I myself am a believer again, these connecting the dots and trying to meet people where they're at. Everybody has a different story and everybody has constraints on, on their company and their situation. And everybody has a unique set of circumstances and assets. And so one of the things I always try to do is try to meet them where they're at. So if you're trying to assess, hey, where am I at? It might be the simple SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, mm -hmm. opportunity, and threat to just kind of understand where you're at and then how you might get there meaning looking forward to whatever system you want to use to come up with a one-year goal and a three-year goal, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily worry about locking yourself into a particular process as much as maybe being open-minded and give yourself, I've used the word a couple of times, I think it's a good one, compass, and then try to figure out what are the, again, we started earlier on talking about probabilities, trying to assign some probabilities to certain outcomes have it happening and then use those things to, to guide uh, your journey. Or, you know, of course, find somebody like a John or all the fabulous people in the Voyager U community to, to help guide you. You know, Rick, uh, uh, you, you might, you, I know you are a growth architect. You're somewhat of a Shackleton. If anybody's a fan of Shackleton, you know, some of all of this sounds, you know, compass and all that. But when you think about it is, a good journey is growth. I think if you, a business is a journey and uh, the worst thing you can do if you're sailing somewhere is to not mind the sails. Boy, go swab the deck, just tunnel vision, just grind at that. But if you're not checking the winds and getting your head above it and you're, what you're talking about, networking, reading, getting outside and someone has to do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's very, it's very much, uh, analogous to, to sailing and, and, and taking a ship from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. Um, at least for me, that's how I'm, that's how I'm deciphering it today. That it seems like it, uh, I, I think growth and maybe the reason is growth is you kind of think about numbers, right? What's the math? What's our, what's our multiplier going to be? What's the revenue going to be math, math, math. And I can see where you'd spend a lot of time on that, but also what's the wins? Where are the wins at? You know, what's, what's our heading? Does our heading need to change a little bit? Um, art and science. That's a fascinating career you've chosen, Rick. 
Well, uh, it is it is interesting, and and I think maybe uh, Dave tying this back in John's comments back into Dave's questions about books, um, focusing on what you can control. Uh, classic uh, twelve step thing is you know focus on what you can control and let go of the rest. I do see people worrying too much about the things that there isn't really a whole lot that they can do to control it. So I'd encourage people to let go of that stuff, figure out what you can control and focus on that. And then the other uh, book that I think gets to um, uh, this, uh, whether we're talking about a compass um, or kind of using uh, some sort of story or guideline to, to build the business, the, the book is a hero brand. And it talks about your customer being the hero and then what can you do to uh, steer them towards success uh, so that they get to be the hero and overcome the the evilness that's that's out there, whether that evilness is other competitors or dynamics in the marketplace that that they can't control, but they have to deal with. And so, John, you're totally right. Art and science. There's some numbers that you can lock into, but there's also a soft side to this that you have to have a little bit of a willingness to go on a gut instinct in the sense of, hey, I've gathered all these data points in the market and I'm willing to listen and I'm willing to do, as we said earlier, a little bit of a pivot, a little bit of tweak to the model. So I'm going to give everybody a movie you have to watch. Master and Commander. Oh, yeah. That's that, So Rick has all, those are great books. Watch that movie and think, grow through that context and you'll get there. Dave, I interrupted you, sorry. No, we're good. And I think, um, I know that there may be a few folks that, are just feeling a little bashful and don't want to ask questions over the recording. And so um, do you have any closing thoughts for the recorded portion, Rick, that you'd like to share with us? Well, I guess uh, one of the things that we talk about um, on Club E are lessons that people have learned that they wish they would have learned sooner. Um, I do think that light bulb went off for me fairly early, but John mentioned it as, you know, you are your network. Um, Voyager U is a fabulous community of, of wonderful people, whether it's you interacting with that community on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, to make contacts or whether that's you working on a project that maybe you need some other expertise and you bring somebody else in and you find them through the Voyager U community. Um, utilizing your network um, and building that network and building the network on a proactive basis before you know you reach uh, some sort of crisis situation. Oh, I got a client situation, and if I don't solve this problem by tomorrow, I'm you know going to lose the client. Well, it's a little late to do that. So so being proactive with building your community and tapping into smart folks like like everybody uh, through Voyager U. Thanks, Rick. And uh, for those that are watching the recording, I um, encourage you to check in every week. We have a new guest star every Friday. Dial in from one to two, and we will see you all next time. For those that are still on, now is open, open season for asking those questions. Thanks, everybody. Unrecorded. <laughs>